This is John Ziegler, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John and Pete. With us this evening, we're at Hill Dog Productions. Hill, your guest, is uh, kind enough to host us while we're in Los Angeles, and we're sitting across the table from radio host turned documentary filmmaker. Turned big ball. Like You are Soldier for justice. Yes. Soldier yes. for justice. <laughs> I like that. I might have to put that on my business you don't card. You have a cape. Yeah. You should get one. So, listeners, if you aren't yet familiar with John Ziegler's most recent work, check out FramingPaterno.com, where you post. I have to be very careful to say this in a way that, of course, helps us in your quest for justice and for a man who could potentially have been the victim of a less than fair trial, <laughs> who is put away for the rest of his life in the yes and that's Jerry Sandusky yeah now look none of the three of us here is in the business of letting out somebody who harms children of course not yeah uh but you're putting out a pretty compelling argument that circumstances added up to Jerry Sandusky not getting a fair shake in his trial it's more than that, and, and I understand why you're, you're phrasing it the way that you are, because to most people, when they hear this subject, they go, what? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, they're closed off. It's only one answer. Right. No one ever told us that Jerry Sandusky might be innocent. The only question was, did Joe Paterno cover it up, uh, and did Penn State cover it up? That was the only question that anyone ever dealt with, and therein lies the key to this whole case. Yep. That's why, see... When people come at with me, what are you crazy? I said, hold on a second. It's that attitude that you have to be crazy to believe that, which was, which allowed this injustice to happen. Because without that belief at the beginning, none of these dominoes fall the way that they did. Right. And so the first thing you need to understand is that this is not some sort of crazy conspiracy theory. In fact, I'm the non-conspiracy person in this all, in this entire case. I'm the only person who's a non-conspiracy person. Now, I've heard you, though, encourage everybody, go read everything. Yes. Go read everybody's account of everything. That is, I'm so glad you mentioned that, And, and especially since it's right off the bat, because I truly believe that all you need to know about what really did and did not happen in the so-called Jerry Sandusky Penn State scandal is go read and watch what I refer to as the other side. Read victim number one Aaron Fisher's book. Watch the interview that the prosecutors did, the only interview they ever did with Armin Katayan on HBO Sports. Uh, read the work of the woman who won the Pulitzer Prize, Sarah Ganim. I, I read the trial transcripts, read the prosecution's closing argument, which is frankly, I got to tell you a joke. It, it's almost when you read the closing and, and uh, arguments of the prosecution and defense, it's like it's flipped upside down. Usually the defense is the one that is appealing to emotion. You know, we've got to do this because it's the right thing. And we need, you know, you're, 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 the defense attorney is the one who is trying to say, you can't put a potentially innocent man behind bars. And it's not about facts. It's not about uh, logic. The prosecution is usually logic, facts. Here's what happened. Bing, bing, bong. It's exactly the opposite. It's the defense that is talking about here are the facts. Here's what happened. Here's what didn't happen. Here's what the prosecution didn't prove. And the prosecution is all about, we can't let this stand. This was right. an injustice. This appealing to emotion, appealing to people's head, heads exploding, which they always do over the issue, and understandably so, of right. child sex abuse. Yep. Yeah. It's this subject matter that gets people so bananas, they don't want to look at what actually did and did not happen. And look, I didn't want this. Sure. I did not want, it's important that people understand how I got involved with this. The, this. the narrative here, I think, is incredibly important to understanding why I'm doing what I'm doing. I this in, has not been good for your career. Oh my God. This has been the worst thing that's ever happened in my life. It, it's been the worst. I've had a lot of bad things happen in my life. This, being involved in this case for the past four and a half years is the worst thing that has ever happened in my life, other than my mother being killed in a car accident, it's the it, it, it has been the most excruciating thing I've ever dealt with. I, I have become depressed beyond comprehension. My career has been destroyed. My marriage has been strained. 
I'm sure eventually my daughter will, you know, she's only four years old. She will eventually suffer because of all of this, because people look at me like either I'm in, I'm insane or I've got some angle or whatever. I mean, I didn't have gray hair that much when we started this. And I'm, you know, I, I've got a lot of gray hairs. I got a lot of wrinkles. I've aged a lot in the last four and a half years. And, and, it, and it's important to understand how I got involved. I live in Southern California. I'm a former talk show host, now a talk show host again to a nationally syndicated weekend show uh, called the John and Leah Show. And I've been doing I've been doing documentary films. I did two major documentary films, one about 9-11, one about the 2008 presidential election. I, I was on the Today Show, uh, you know, uh, even before this case, I was on the Today Show twice involving this case with Matt Lauer. But I had a reputable career as a documentary filmmaker, a very successful film called Media Malpractice about the 2008 election. And when the whole story broke in November 2011, I smelled a rat, not on the Jerry Sandusky element. Right. That's important to point out. Yeah. I presumed like everybody else. Well, oh, he did he, it. He must be guilty. He got he, caught in the shower. Yeah, yeah, all I mean, of that. Yeah, I mean, Joe Paterno is getting fired. Why? Obviously, someone at Something Penn State would stand happened. up. Yeah, the town it, it, wouldn't fire it, Joe right, Paterno. Right, he wouldn't fire Joe Paterno, a legend for sixty-one years. Tear down his statue. Exactly. None Take of that would happen victories. unless unless someone at least checked the basic math. Yeah. And what I found is, and this is, you know, if I could encapsulate in this one sentence of my role in this is that we have this incredibly complex mathematical equation mm -hmm. that to this day, even the mainstream news media doesn't claim to have totally figured out, you know, whether there was a cover-up or whatever. And no one bothered to check the math at the start of the equation. Yeah. And, and no one checked the math. I checked the math. There you go. And, and the math is not even close. It, yeah. That's what the part is. This, I need to emphasize this. It's not a matter of reasonable doubt. I would not be giving up my life for reasonable doubt for a child molester. If, if I thought that Jerry Sandusky was guilty and it was just a crappy trial and it was rushed to judgment and they didn't really prove it, I'd be like, okay, you know what? So what? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's the way the, the, it's not good. You know, you don't want that in your justice system, but I wouldn't, it's not a hill I would die on. Right. I am positive he's innocent and it's not yeah. even close. That's what the most amazing part of this case is. It's not close. People who actually sit down and look at this with a reasoned approach are almost universal going, holy shit. Let's talk about a reasoned approach. Real quick, one thing for admin stuff. You guys have to go listen to John's appearance on Jay Moore's show because yeah. he covers a lot of ground. And we're yes. going to do our best to not recover that ground because sure. there's just so much stuff. Yeah. So we, You could do eight hours on this easy. Yeah, yeah easy. And and we're not going to roll over. We're not going to attack you, but we're not going to roll please. over. We're going to ask the fair questions. Please right? attack yes. me. I, please. No, no, no. We're not gonna, we don't do attacks. <laughs> please. Please. But so – as an intel, I'm an intel guy by trade, army right. guy, right? And I'm dying to see a link analysis. I'm dying to see a timeline. I want to see analytical tools because I, I know you're going to get into this. Some of the dates can't line up. Like no. these things could not have occurred in the same time because these two guys' stories aren't the same. We're talking about the victim's stories. Well, you know, the timeline of all this is incredibly important. This is, as you know, in almost every case, the timeline is everything. Right. And because of the way this story evolved, see, people have to remember, and I know they don't because they didn't live it like I did, but back in November 2011 when the story broke, this happened at lightning speed. Or Sinusky gets arrested on November 5th. Paterno is fired on November 9th. Wow. But, and by the way, it's even faster than that. On November 5th, Paterno is praised by the attorney general's office in an article by the woman who ended up, ended up winning the Pulitzer Prize, Sarah Ganim, as having reacted appropriately in his response to the Jerry Sandusky sex abuse suspicions. That's, That's on November, November 5th. Th November 5th. Four days later, he is fired on a cell phone after having spent 61 years literally building the university. The University of Penn State, Penn State University, was a farm school before <laughs> Joe Paterno got there. He literally built the place. He literally, literally built the library. He literally, literally built Beaver Stadium. I, I mean, it's a, it, so for that to happen in that speed, by the way, no real revelations, certainly that were truthful, occurred between November 5th and November 9th. It's just that the media created an unbelievable firestorm that caused a panic. This was a flat out Panic by the media, created by the media, and by the Penn State Board of Trustees 
who didn't know what the fuck was going on. They had no idea. And what they were believing was what the media was telling them, what the prosecution was telling them in a leaked 23-page grand jury presentment, which had no business being public, and what the governor of the state, Tom Corbett, was telling them, who happened to be the attorney general who had started the investigation. Now, you have all sorts of conflicts of interest here, and the media's conflict is the is the biggest. Because let's face it, folks, we no longer live in a world where the media gives a rat's ass about what's true. It's about what the narrative is that will be good for them that day. Right. right. Let's put some context on this era, too, because in 2007, the Duke lacrosse scandal breaks yep. out. And those guys absolutely raped that girl in their frat house, having a party, but all false. All false, right? So this is just a few years before. Yes. And it's not the first and we time. learned nothing. And we learned nothing, right? You so, would think yes. you would think there would have been some hesitation, especially with somebody of the caliber of Joe Paterno, right? right? Yes. I mean, you would think that that would buy him maybe a day or right. two days of <laughs> well, hey, hold on, let's wait and see what what happens here. How about a guy on trial for his life? Can we make sure that that guy has a fair assessment of what happened? There was no regardless even if Jerry Sandusky was guilty. There is zero doubt he got an unfair trial. Let me prove to you, by the way. I can prove to you in, in 30 seconds how unfair his trial was. Uh, again, I believe he's innocent. I did not believe this at the start. I believe this after interviewing him twice in prison and investigating this way more than anyone ever should have been forced to do. But here's the one. If there was one thing about how unfair his trial was, and I didn't get a chance to get into this with Jay Moore in that two-and-a-half-hour podcast. So this is new new stuff for the people who have listened to the Jay Moore uh, podcast. In the one of the accuser, victim number eight's case. Wow, right? okay. Right. Vic, victim number eight. Here's Jerry Sandusky got convicted of five major crimes. Okay. In a case where there was no accuser. Okay, fine. There's no accuser. You just can't find the person, whatever. No direct witness. Hmm. No date for the event. No contemporaneous report of the event. And wait about, wait for this one. Here it comes. The only supposed witness who was a hearsay witness who didn't testify because he allegedly had dementia was interviewed by the prosecution before the trial. Yes. And asked three times, three times, who did you see that night? He said, was it, it was asked, was it Jerry Sandusky? He says three times. No, it was not Jerry Sandusky. So Jerry Sandusky is convicted of five five counts of major crimes yes. with where the only witness doesn't testify because of dementia and is on record saying it wasn't him. The hearsay witnesses should never have been allowed because it was clearly hearsay. There was no accuser because, frankly, the event didn't happen. That's why they didn't find an accuser. Uh, because fr- you got to remember, in this case, it's absurd to to claim you can't find an accuser because the publicity is extraordinary and there's three or four million dollars on the line. Right. There's three or four million dollars in it for you if you're a, a prominent Jerry Sandusky accuser. So you cannot claim, you cannot claim unless someone died that they, that the, there's an accuser out there that just didn't come forward because they didn't hear about the Jerry Sandusky case or they just don't want three or four million dollars. That's a, that's absurd. But, and then you add in no date. And no contemporaneous report. And by the way, this no date is something that happens throughout this case. There's never a specific date. And why is that? Because if you have a specific date, if you, if you get, if you, the accuser is narrowed down to a specific date, Jerry might be out of town that day. Right. There, you there, might you, have been out of town you, that day. Right. <laughs> you know? So yeah. there's a way to prove that right. having a date is the only way once Jerry loses presumption of innocence, which he lost very early on once Joe Paterno was fired. The only way he can quote unquote prove his innocence, which is what he had to do is if there's a date. Mm-hmm. Well, none of these people ever gave dates. And of course they were, they were, it was, it was said to be okay that there weren't dates because how do you possibly remember something that happened, you know, years ago when you were a, a 13 or 14 year old boy? Let me address but, this point because I want to just take a quick recap for our audience because if you got lost in what just happened and your mind is a little bit blown, I'm sure it is. Let's just take a step back yeah. and, and recap. First of all, John Ziegler has no stake in this thing. <sighs> Zero. Second of all, was not researching Jerry Sandusky, was researching Joe Paterno exactly. and what happened 
to Joe Paterno. Right. When you happened upon all of the events that you strung across in a timeline, like any good journalist would do, to understand the sequence of the facts. Right. And the math didn't add up. And let me tell you, I mean, you have a question? No, well, yeah, I do. Here's my, I, let me just ask Pete. Yeah. What's the last time Dodgers won the World Series? 1988. Okay. Here's why I ask that, because I any can't sports wait to hear the answer to this. fan, right. any, oh, sports remembers the fan year. Right. any sports player, right. anybody on the staff of a, of a sports team of any sort, especially one as important to the community as Penn State, knows exactly what the fuck date it is. Ask me, ask me the date when my marriage broke up. Ask when, me that. When did your marriage break up? I don't remember the date, but I remember this. It was the week that Dale Earnhardt died. You see what I'm there saying? You go. So there are always landmarks on the sports calendar that say. I love what you're saying here, and I wish I would have made this point. And, sooner, this is a person who's being raped. Okay, but here let me let me expound on this because this is a great okay. point that he's making, Do it. and and it, it relates to the key to this whole case because most people probably remember the whole Mike McQuarrie episode, right? And that's the key, yeah that's the assi- former assistant coach at Penn State who allegedly saw, although he never said he saw, he said he heard uh, Jerry Sandusky raping a young boy in the shower. Now the, it's so fast now. I don't even know this is what what was on your mind when you said that, but it, you know sports people are trained to remember years. Oh. Oh, 73 or 85 or 98. Would this happen? That happened. It's, it's, it's in your brain, especially as a football coach, because as a football coach, it's the, obviously the fall of one year. It's not like basketball where it carries over. What is Mike McQuarrie coach? He's a, why he was the wide receiver. He's a wide receivers coach. If you say 1992 to Mike McQuarrie, he should tell you all fucking five wide receivers on the team. Exactly. So here's, here's why this is important to the case. And this is why this is a fantastic point you're making. Because when Mike McQuarrie, 10 years after this event, is finally asked by investigators, hey, what the hell happened under circumstances which I hope we will get to because they are amazing and critical to understanding what was going through his mind. But when he is asked about what happened, he gives them a date. He gives them March 9th, 2002. Okay. The problem is that wasn't the right date. No. In fact, it wasn't the right month. In fact, it wasn't the right year. And by the way, not only is it the wrong year, which for a football coach, you're right, is unusual to get a year wrong because you're, you're trained to think in years. He thinks it happens after 9-11 when it actually happens before 9-11, which is another memory marker that I think is highly unusual. So you were, we're supposed to For believe- our entire generation, and, and it, it, let's go back a generation. Everybody in our parents' generation knows what they were doing when JFK was shot. Exactly. And if you ask them about any event in their life, before or after. it's either before or after, and you know for damn sure. Exactly. And I know exactly what happened on September 11th, and I know in my category of memories what happened before that date and what happened after. Bingo. Well, Mike McQuarrie doesn't. And what does that mean? And it's important to also understand how that date got shifted. So McQuarrie testifies at the grand jury. And mm. when, and Joe Paterno, this is maybe the most amazing fact in this entire fucking case of, of a million amazing facts. Joe Paterno died not knowing the correct date of the episode that destroyed his career. Imagine wow. that. He, he thought... He thought, because that's what it was reported by Mike McQuarrie, that it happened March 9, 2002. After Paterno dies, we learn, uh uh-uh, we learn this from email and other documentary evidence, that it actually occurred in February 1st of 2001. And guess who was the person who first facilitated an investigation of that date because he knew it was wrong? Jerry Sandusky. Jerry Sandusky said, wait a minute. I know 2002 isn't right because I know the kid that was in the shower that night and I know that that episode occurred after, after my 9/11. book. Well, no, no, because my book, his book had come out uh-huh. just a couple of weeks before this episode. His book comes out in at the very beginning of 2001. So he could never understood understand why in the world is McQuarrie saying this happened in 2002 because Alan Myers is the kid's name. There's no way Alan Myers was the was, was that situation was 2002 because it happened just after my book my book comes out in january like january 1st of 2001 so so Sandusky tells his attorney Joe Amendola they got the date wrong and Amendola is like telling the prosecution dudes you, you got the date you, you wrong. sure this isn't this isn't wrong well they eventually they admit 
you know, they admit, which should have been a freaking bombshell. Yeah. I mean, should have been a mass. In, in, in my mind, that was the first moment when I there was one, a couple articles that had the headline "McQuarrie date change," and I'm like, "What? Yeah. Hope wh- what? Wh- when? What? Yes. Hope because I'm thinking if you really saw a local legend raping a young boy, you remember the fucking year that happened. You, there is no that is chance. Seared indelibly. Right, there yes. is no chance. There, however, Uh-oh. if what I think happens really happens, you do get the date wrong because it was no big fucking deal at the time. Yeah. It was no deal at all. All it was was an excuse to go see Joe Paterno because it was an open job that Kenny Jackson had just left to go to the Pittsburgh Steelers, who was the wide receivers coaching uh, coach at Penn State two days before this whole thing happens. He goes to, to the Pittsburgh Steelers. There's an open job. And his dad, who I believe was very much in this mindset, a very manipulative guy, thinks – Boy, you know, this is a weird thing you saw, Jerry, in the shower. Maybe you go see Joe Paterno, get some great FaceTime with Joe Paterno with an open job, show him what a great Boy Scout you are, and who knows what might happen. Interestingly, the ultimate proof that there is no cover-up, was no cover at at Penn State, is the fact that there's this open job, wide receiver's coaching position, for which Mike McQuarrie was qualified as a graduate assistant, which McQuarrie does not get. Now, if there was a cover-up, the first thing Joe Paterno would have done is said, Take care of the guy. Mike, you know what? Thanks for bringing us to our attention. You've been doing a fantastic job. Right. And we just, by the way, congratulations. We'll deal with that. Yeah, we'll deal with that. And by the way, you're, you're now the new wide receivers coach. Congratulations. Right. Uh, and that does not happen. And by the way, not only does it not happen, this is the most amazing thing. The, the same job <laughs> opens up again three years later, and that's when McQuarrie gets it. Well, this is it right here. So there's the quid pro quo thing. You know, you've reported this. We're going to cover this up. This is going to be a thing. This is how we're going to compensate you. Not, we're not going to do anything for you. You're still a graduate better. assistant. Yes. Which, by the way, it's important for, for non-football fans to know. As a graduate assistant, you are nothing. nothing. You, you are, you, you're not even really a tech, you're technically not even an employee. Right. Uh, you, you are a, a worm uh, on the football coaching staff. And so, uh, and to be the wide receivers coach is a big stinking deal. Right. Uh, and, and that's what Mike ends up getting the job three years later, way after this whole thing is in the in the dustbin of history, at least right. that's what they're thinking, because it was no big deal because there was no assault. That's the only way to logically assess this, especially when you know the story of the kid in the shower, Alan Myers, which is one thousand percent consistent with no assault and inconsistent with any kind of assault. So, so let's again recap because there's so much meat on this thing and correct me when i'm wrong okay so we've got mike mcquery coming in who has a date that's wrong now and and john and i talked about using a reasonable man standard like i try to do in court people get dates wrong sure sure but that's one little piece maybe you get the date wrong but this is a a rape that you are witness to either audibly or If that or was visually. the only thing, I wouldn't care. Right, right, exactly. But it's, 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 it's a part of a larger picture. So here comes, what, uh, what's Mike McCreary's size? He's like 6'3". Oh, he's, he's six foot four, two hundred and twenty five. So here's where the he was a Division I football player. Right. And, and he's redheaded, by yeah. the way. So there's no possible way to forget that it's Mike McCreary. All right. right. If, if, he made him, if he made his presence known, this is important. Maybe the m- most important thing that I learned in my two interviews with Jerry Sandusky in prison for Many, many hours. And this is, might be shocking to people who followed the case. Jerry Sandusky had no idea Mike McQueary was the witness until the public did 10 years later, which, which is important for two reasons. Number one, it shows that Mike lied in his testimony that he made his presence known. He claims in his testimony he made eye contact with Sandusky and eye contact with the boy because he's trying to make it seem like he did something to stop what had he claims that he witnessed because it makes no sense to the average man standard right. that a, a hulking 27-year-old stud walks in on a boy being raped and does nothing. Yes. Does, By a man who is in his 60s, uh, almost, late 60s, almost, late Late fifties, late fifties. So uh, either way, yeah, he does. Nothing. In fact, he gives him the look, right? Like he's the rock well, or something, right? And then keeps on about his business. He actually testified that he figured 
I don't, I, this is my paraphrase. This is not the exact words, but this is a paraphrase of Mike McQuarrie's testimony when asked about that is that he basically said, well, I thought I had broken the mood. I mean, they, in other words, that somehow the, the boy that he left there was going to be okay now because he made sure that Sandusky knew someone was on to him. None of that happened. Yeah. And we know it none of it happened because if it had, Jerry would have known Mike was the witness. And I know Jerry didn't know that, that Mike was the witness for a number of reasons, including I've spoken to the guy who was his advisor during the grand jury investigation who separated from Jerry after he got arrested thinking that he was guilty. I said, did you guys ever talk about the McQuarrie episode? He says, we talked about several potential episodes. We never even contemplated a McQuarrie episode. I said, well, so I go back to Jerry. I said, what's that? What's that all about? And Jerry says, I didn't know McQuarrie. There was a McQuarrie episode because Mike, if he was there, never made his presence known to us. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete Turner. And if you like the show, do us a favor. Yeah, share it. That's the biggest thing, honestly. All your social media outlets, all your friends, let them know the ones that you like. I mean, we make this show for you guys. If you think it's great, say so. Say so by sharing it. Say so by putting a comment in after the show. Also, if you go to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts, give us a rating. Give us a review. If you think the show is great, please give us five stars and say so. And if you think the show really sucks, please give us five stars and say so. Because, <laughs> heck, we're listening that's right. You can't be more approachable than us. We, we want to make the show better. If there's something that we're missing, let us know. That really is how you help us. That's right. Tell us all about it. Thanks for listening. And now back to the show. It's impossible with Mike's persona and the red hair that you could possibly not know that it was Mike You don't Mike miss McQueen. that guy walking there, into a room. There's no fucking way. And, and it's also it's important for a second reason. Because Jerry, assuming you and I. You know, I started this not believing anything Jerry Sandusky told me. Sure. Everything I have to. I presumed everything he told me was a manipulation or a lie of some sort until almost just about everything he's ever told me checks out in some way, shape or form, uh, that it's possible to check out. So, but I presumed he was, he was lying, but he, if you, if you accept that he's a rational witness, which I absolutely believe that he is, he becomes a perfect witness with regard to Mike McQuarrie's behavior over that ensuing 10 years because he doesn't know Mike's the witness. Mm -hmm. So he can perceive what Mike's doing and not doing through an unbiased lens. And what's really interesting is that after this this episode that happened in 2001, not 2002, as Mike had testified to, Mike McQuarrie plays in not one but two Jerry Sandusky sponsored golf tournaments. He jokes around with Jerry physically, according to numerous witnesses, at, at a Easter Seals charity football game. He asks Jerry several years later about a walk on that had come to Penn State from a high school where Jerry was a volunteer coach. None of those things make any goddamn sense if this same person had witnessed Jerry Sandusky assaulting a young boy. No fucking way. There's yes. no, there is no. Not raising money for that guy or playing in his golf tournament. Right. right. There, right. There, there is, there is no in way. In fact, you're going to talk shit about him. Right. Yeah. All nonstop. Well, and interestingly, interesting. So I say to Jerry, so how was your relationship with Mike during this? Yeah. And he says, it was fine until he remembers in retrospect a chilling of the relationship that Mike seemed cold to him in late 2010, early 2011. Well, what's happening then? Right. At that time, investigators have come to Mike McQuarrie. And here's what I believe happened. I'm almost positive this is what happens. So for two years, investigators have one accuser of Jerry Sandusky, a guy by the name of Aaron Fisher, who wrote a book. He's victim number one. I urge you to read the book because if you do, first of all, you'll get a hell of a lot of laughs if you understand the case. And two, you'll understand that Jerry Sandusky is innocent. Right. But, but, but more importantly than that, we've got him for two years. The investigation is going nowhere because they can't find any other accusers. All of a sudden, they get an email the day after Tom Corbett is elected governor of Pennsylvania, oddly enough, which is a weird coincidence. I'm not a conspiracy person, but that's really odd that this anonymous email comes the day after the, the he's elected governor. And so then they go and they go to Mike McQuarrie. And I believe they say to Mike, remember, Mike McQuarrie is an assistant football coach. He's not a rocket science, okay? It's not, not, a, not a rocket scientist. By, ever, by all accounts, not even a very smart football player. Uh, probably got into Penn State because – 
because of uh, the football and not because of any academics. Sure. Uh, nothing against Mike, but no one I've talked to thinks that he's a bright guy. So the investigators come to him and they say, and by the way, this is important. And I you go to YouTube. You can check, you can look up uh, Don Van Atta of ESPN and John Ziegler, Mike McQuarrie. You can w- listen to this audio for yourself. I have Don Van Atta of ESPN verifying everything I'm about to tell you that he was going to report it in ESPN, the magazine. And then, and then, the only explanation is he got censored because they were afraid of what this would mean to their narrative. But here's what Mike McQuarrie was going through his mind. His wife gets a phone call from investigators. She calls him and says, hey, these investigators want to talk to you. Mike's testimony would later be, I knew they were calling about Jerry. Thank God someone was finally coming to talk to me 10 years later <laughs> about this event I've been wanting to talk about for all this time. That's not what happened. Right. What really happened is Mike's shitting himself. Yeah. Because here's why. Mike's married, and in April of that year, if not other times during that year, but we know in April of that year, he was sending naked pictures of his penis to a woman, not his wife, through a Penn State phone. He was farving people. Yes, he was farving at least one woman. All right. And And if you farve one, you farve ten. I agree with that. In yes. fact, I've been sent some of his far photos nice. to, to other women. I don't have the, the photos that are in question, but, but Don Van Atta, I have him on audio saying that he had the whole story completely nailed. In fact, even talked to people that McQuery immediately called in a panic saying, Oh my God, they must have found out about the photos because you have to remember, unlike Favre, if McQuery gets caught, that's it. It's over. It's over. It is, his career is over. He right. works for, he's a nobody. He works for Joe freaking Paterno. Mm-hmm. If this becomes public, his Out. career is over. Right. Done. There is no questions asked. So he is shitting himself. So when he eventually. He's also shitting himself too, because if this comes around and he had seen what he had seen, he's culpable. Thank you. He's yes. That's the other, that's the other thing. Didn't report. I guarantee it's a great point because I guarantee. So what happens is he, he gets, he, he finally has a meeting. By the way, it's three weeks from the time he gets that first call to the time he, in his lawyer's office, he writes out a statement, which is the most dramatic statement he ever gives in the entire case, far more dramatic than anything he ever testifies mm-hmm. to in person. In handwritten in his own lawyer's office, three weeks later, you're exactly right. I believe what they say to him is he's, he's first of all thrilled that they're not talking about the photographs of his penis. Sure. They're also telling him, what you just said, yeah. which is, by the way, Mike, you do know that you probably should have come to us about this, right? right? I mean, and so now he's thinking he's culpable in some way, which theoretically he could have been. And they're also, and this is key, they're also telling him, I believe, and, it, and there's there's logical evidence to back this up, that they're saying, Mike, we've been investigating Jerry Sandusky for two years. We've got a kid, Aaron Fisher, who says he's been abused Many, many times by Jerry. We think he's a pedophile. We got a monster in this town. You seem to have saw something. Can you help us? Mm-hmm. Now, if you're Mike McQuery, right? Under those circumstances where you got some pressure on yourself, you're not real bright. You want to, you want to save yourself. You want to try to help them. You th- remember seeing something that weirded you out. And I, by the way, have never, ever uh, begrudge Mike McQuarrie feeling weird about sure. walking in on Jerry Sandusky with a boy in a shower. That's weird, although not as weird as it seems now, which I'd be happy to explain. But I get that that was weird. So Mike McQuarrie turning... Especially some- if you need something weird. Well, You know, he needs something to say. He, well, know? I think he was weirded out because otherwise he doesn't call his dad and, 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 and his dad's friend, a doctor by the name of Dr. Dranoff, who importantly testifies that he asked Mike that night three times, mm-hmm. did you see a sex act? And yeah. Mike says no, no three times, three times. Mm-hmm. Then that's his, that's his dad's friend, um, from the night of the event. So, but, but I'm not, I'm not begrudging him that he saw something weird, but turning something weird into what the prosecution wants. When they say to him, sure, you didn't, certainly sounds like you may have seen a sex act. Yeah. Oh, you, oh yeah, that's what I saw. Because yeah, if, like. if I'm trying to build a case, I, I need a sex act. Right. Well, you, they, they, and if they, I'm trying to distract people from pictures of my penis. Yeah, well, I'm going to give you a sex act. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, ex- exactly. I've always felt like Mike's like, sure, what do you need? I mean, you know, Mike in his, his mentality at that point is, what do you need? And, you know, this certainly is plausible. It could have been a sex act. It kind of sounded like one, even though I didn't see anything. People need to understand. Go back and read Mike McQuarrie's testimony. People think 
that he testified that he walked in and saw Jerry Sadusky with an erect penis raping, raping a boy. A child, that, right. That's not even in the stratosphere of what right. he says. He says he heard slapping sounds and then threw a mirror in a steamy shower, not even directly seeing. He sees a reflection for two or three seconds. This is his own testimony. Two or three seconds, he sees Sandusky and a boy, and he's not sure what they're doing. Now, Jerry and the boy independently both say that they were playing some sort of of po- what they call Polish uh, hockey, which I don't even know what the hell that is, but some sort of weird shower game. Jerry is a weird guy, all right? I don't even like Jerry Sandusky. Okay. Um, he is a, a, a bit of a doofus. Uh, he's a very naive person. I think I, and it sounds cliche, I didn't believe it with Michael Jackson because I believe Michael Jackson was guilty as hell, though I've, I've gotten to know Tom Mesereau, his attorney, pretty well, who has actually written an op-ed saying there should be a new trial in this case. And so my, my mind is open on Michael Jackson. But I believe that if there ever was a perpetual 12-year-old boy, it's Jerry Sandusky. He has five adopted children. He's never had an, a, a biological children, child of his own. I don't think he has a sexual bone in his body. I've never talked to anybody. I've been around football coaches a lot. I've coached high school football. I've covered high school, college, and pro football. Football coaches are sexual beings as much as any man, any men I know. We're talking about an activity that involves a guy with a lot of testosterone. Right, exactly. speaking. Right, and I've never met anybody, anybody. I've spoken to if not more than dozens, probably hundreds of people who knew Jerry Sandusky. No one has ever said Jerry has ever even made a sexual joke, a sexual innuendo, anything remotely sexual, and they all describe him exactly the same way. 12-year-old boy. He's a goofball who is a 12-year-old boy who just... And and this is why, I mean, his, his whole life was devoted to trying to help kids. I know it sounds weird, it sounds suspicious, but it also sounds... Far more suspicious than it should because these events occur. This is really important. These events occur, the ones that he gets accused of, occur before we know about the Catholic Church scandal. But they come out after. Sure. And wow. that's critical. That is critical. That's critical because, because after the Catholic Church scandal, everyone's mindset Perceptions is... Perceptions are all different. Exactly. <laughs> you and, know, this this goes right back to the Mike McCreary thing, mm-hmm. where you you need something to have happened. And mm-hmm. and we've got Jerry Sandusky's weird. Maybe right. he's he's on the autism scale. Who knows? But I agree with that. He's weird, right? And now when you look back in retrospect, you're like, well, maybe there was, was something. I can believe that Mike McCreary is like, oh, shit. You know, just right. like we were with the Catholic Church, like, oh, shit. Exactly. All these things, and then... I don't think Mike McQuarrie knowingly lied. Sure, okay. I think Mike McQuarrie was manipulated so, and by investigators who, by the way, I don't think that they created a what they thought was a fake case. Mm-hmm. I think the Catholic Church scandal, which was huge in Pennsylvania, that's sure. another, that's another sure. element of this, huge story in Pennsylvania, uh, probably more so any other place than Boston, right. Philadelphia, uh, and in Pennsylvania... Catholic Church scandal was massive. So in the prosecutor's mind, they're going, we got another Catholic Church. Yeah, we church. can't let this go. Right, right. In their mindset, and by the way, one of the key detectives, God by the name of Anthony Sassano, who came into the case under highly suspicious circumstances, which I'd love to get into because it's a fascinating element of this case that no one knows about, um, that I discovered, is it, he had no expertise in child sex abuse. He was a narcotics agent. Yeah. And so he he's thinking, and I'm guessing, seems like the Catholic Church to me. You know, we got Joe Paterno as the Pope, and we got Sandusky as the Cardinal, and the Penn State as the Catholic Church, and everyone's acting like football is God. It fits. It And the media has absolutely bought into that Catholic Church narrative with regard to Penn State, and it's ludicrous. The the most important thing people don't understand, and that's the most important thing. Yeah, you have a lot of keys and most right, important right, but, but hold on a second. The, <laughs> yeah. One of the biggest media myths uh-huh. of this whole deal it, which is key to understanding supposedly how these accusers reacted to Jerry the way that they did, is that somehow Jerry Sandusky was a walking god around State College. Utter bull crap. <laughs> he was retired. The, the, the main accuser in this case, Aaron Fisher, claims that he was abused from 2005 to 2008 a hundred times, which is 
ludicrous on his face since he was a a, a a very athletic wrestler who could kick adults ass i there was a video of him kicking a next door neighbor's ass a guy in his 30s when he was 12 or 13 years old and now uh, we're talking about jerry sandusky in his 50s right right um and we, we a guy who's a star track athlete but my point my point of this is this is 2005 to 2008 jerry sandusky is retired as an assistant coach, not the head coach, mm-hmm. an assistant coach, he's retired for five years when he meets Aaron Fisher. Aaron Fisher doesn't even know Jerry Sandusky is a football coach. Huh. He does, it's not even part of his experience. He knows Jerry Sandusky is a goofy guy who runs the Second Mile charity. Right. I, I mean, the, uh, to me, the most important word or most significant word in the English language is former. When someone is a former anything, they are not treated the same way as when they were in that position, sure. and he, he was. That's a, why you have to put former in it. So you're right. Like, oh, you were somebody. Right. Oh, you were yeah. not anymore. Okay. Yeah. Moving on. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Moving on. You're not important anymore. I mean, but he was an assistant coach. Now he was a very prominent assistant, and he is given credit for having won at least one of the national championships at Penn State. But he was no god by any stretch of the imagination. So can uh, I want to ask a couple of reasonable man questions? Please. Why is Jerry Sandusky in the shower with the young boy? It's a great question. With no one else around to validate. Well, his. in the situations where I've had to counsel or have somebody below me, especially if they're of a, a female gender, I always have the door open. Of course. I always uh, yeah, have gender doesn't even there. matter. Right. You understand what's appropriate. And sure. Like, hey, there's only two of us another here. Another set of Let's eyes. Just, right. For Let's... everybody's benefit. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then the other question is, is he adopted five kids? Mm-hmm. Is there any implication at all that he ever did anything inappropriate with this kid sexually? I'll get to the, I'll do that in order. All right. Okay. So the first question is an, an incredibly important one. And I fully acknowledge that for a lot of people, I don't really fully understand this, but I acknowledge that this is a reality. There are a lot of people who don't even care that Jerry Sandusky never sexually molested anybody. All they know is he showered with somebody and he belongs in jail. Now right. that's, or, or to die in prison. Now that to me is a bit, it's more than bizarre. I mean, first of all, there's nothing technically or inherently illegal in doing it. I'm not suggesting it was a remotely good idea. Right. Um, it was obviously a horrendous idea. In fact, Jerry has said to me, you know, I, I certainly regret doing it because he's going to die in prison because of it. Right. But here's what was going on. First thing you need to understand is Jerry Sandusky grew up in a wreck home, right? Mm. He, a, a wreck home in a different era right. where everybody is naked all the time. People swim naked. They shower naked. Nudity, not a big deal in Jerry Sandusky's experience. He is from a different generation. And I would suggest to you that in 1998, which is, it's also important to point out, people think now that Jerry Sandusky was showering naked with young boys on a constant basis. To my knowledge, we only know of two times for sure that that ever happened. Twice. Once in 1998 and 2001, I would submit to you that in 1998, State College, Pennsylvania, known as Happy Valley, Pennsylvania, culturally, might as well have been 1958. 1998, before the, ch- the ch- Catholic Church sex abuse scandal, it's, a, it's before even the turn of the century. I, I've been to State College many times. I grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia. I understand rural Pennsylvania pretty darn well. It's a different mentality. It's not the same cynical place we live in, for better or for worse, today. So 1998 might as well be 1958. And then the third thing I would say, we got the, his background, his generational uh, differences, the fact that culturally State College was not the same place that it is today in 2016. And then there's the kids themselves. The kid that was in the Mike McQuarrie episode, Jerry Zanusky did not look at as a normal kid. It was his son. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. His name is Alan Myers. And here are all the things that happened with Alan Myers and Jerry Sandusky after the Mike McQuarrie episode. This is incredibly important. This is the heart of the whole case. So Alan Myers is a month short of his 14th birthday in the Mike McQuarrie episode. Now, that to me is important because Mike McQuarrie claims he saw a 10-year-old boy. The prosecution actually tried to lie to the judge and the grand jury and say it was an eight-year-old boy. The, the, the men in the prosecution of this case are very much aware that a 13, 14-year-old boy is totally different than an eight- or a 10-year-old boy. Completely different worlds. So they are constantly trying to drive the ages 
down as much as they can because they don't and want drive to, the severity up. Right. They don't want a, a post puberty boy because a post puberty boy who knows what sex is, who can defend himself and who's heterosexual is not going to without drugs, alcohol or a lot of money allow an old man to physically sexually abuse him. It's just not going to happen without a, some sort of a, a fight back. There, there is another po- possibility. He's got a 50 foot wide garrison freak flag. Maybe. Like and then say, so, but then it's not right. Well, I, well, that's a whole different issue of, of consent, but, but it's important to point out every single one of these accusers, unlike the Catholic church case, because I, I urge people watch the movie spotlight. If you watch the movie spotlight, uh, and know the Penn State case, you go, well, what the fuck? There's nothing the same here. There's nothing the same, including, by the way, many of the accusers in the Catholic Church case happen to be gay men. Nothing wrong with that. But it, what, what happened in the Catholic Church case is those pedophiles were able to have, for lack of a better term, gaydar. They knew which kids were gay and might be more open to an advance. None of these guys, none of them are remotely gay. They are almost all married, all have girlfriends. I, you know, I've seen all their Facebook posting, not, not even a shred of doubt that they're heterosexual. And so to me, I go, wait a minute, that, that doesn't make any sense. But let me go back to Alan Myers. So Alan Myers is almost 14 years old. He's almost, he's a little over two years short of winning a varsity letter on his high school football team. He's not an infant. Okay. He's not, he's not a little boy. This is a kid in Pennsylvania who's playing varsity football. He's two years short of winning a varsity letter on his high school football okay. team. Two, so two years here, short. So he's, right. he's almost 14 years old, but, he but is he's a, an athlete, but he's an athlete. He's a football player. Here are all the things that happen after this event. So in his senior year of his high school football season, he plays two years in high school football as a letterman on a varsity. He doesn't have a dad. Jerry, Jerry's his dad. So who does he ask to stand in at his senior high school football game? Jerry Sandusky. And that's who does it. In his spring. This is two years after the two and a half years. Two, the alleged two, it gets way better. Timeline. It, it, Timeline. No, it gets, Timeline, it gets you know? way better. Yes. It gets, gets way better. So in the spring of that year, he graduates. He asks, Jerry Sandusky to speak as the commencement speaker at his high school graduation, which Jerry does. It's on the public record, West Branch High School. Jerry Sandusky, commencement speaker, at Alan Myers' request. Alan Myers then um, goes to Penn State, got help getting in by Jerry Sandusky. Where does he live for three months going to summer classes at Penn State? He lives with the Sanduskys for three months. He then goes into the Marines. Okay, now the, the Marines thing is important because – we're not dealing with a wallflower here, right? We're not dealing with a guy who's timid and afraid and, oh, my God, I'm, I, I can't do with everything, what everything Jerry tells me to do because, you know, Jerry's my God and, and he's been abusing me, but I'm just going to keep going back to my abuser. No, he's, he's a, he ends up being a sergeant in the Marine Corps who, um, when Jerry, his mother dies while Alan Myers is stationed in uh, North Carolina and Alan Myers drives 10 and a half hours each way to attend the funeral for Jerry's mother. Not for Jerry, not for Jerry's wife, for Jerry's mother, who he didn't even know that much. We're talking about what is effectively a family member. It it gets, you're exactly right. And it gets even more amazing. So then Alan Myers gets married. And Alan Myers, who does he invite to his wedding? He invites Jerry and Dottie Sandusky to his wedding. And then at that wedding, Jerry Sandusky and Alan Myers take a photograph together where Alan is in full Marine garb, arm in arm. That photo, that photo is used as the photograph in the retirement letter that Jerry puts out to the public when he retires from the Second Mile Charity in 2010, a year before the shit hits the fan. And by the way, there's only one person in the history of the Second Mile, which had been going on since 1977, that Jerry Sandusky even references in that resignation letter. It's Alan Myers. He spends an entire paragraph talking about Alan Myers. Now, think about this. Forget about Alan Myers' section of this story, which makes no flippin' sense for him to be an abuse victim, right? But if Jerry Sandusky is guilty of this, these crimes, he has to be a criminal mastermind of epic proportions. <laughs> and this criminal mastermind decides... To spotlight not just one of his victims, but his primary 
victim in the Mike McCree episode in a public letter by name and photo? That's insane. That's insane if Jerry is guilty. It's perfectly innocent and plausible and makes total sense if he's innocent, which is what I believe is the case. Right. And from both sides of that equation, I mean, you know, a- Alan Myers treats Jerry Sandusky like his fr- like his f- his family member. Right. So here's what happens once Jerry gets accused. This is where things get really interesting and devious. So Jerry, uh, the, the word of his grand jury leaks out illegally, I believe, and that's being adjudicated in the, in the post-conviction relief process. But it gets leaked out by the woman who would end up winning the Pulitzer Prize, I believe illegitimately, Sarah Gannam, in March of 2011. I believe that that article revealing the grand jury investigation was basically a Craigslist ad by the prosecution looking for new victims because they had a crappy case, even though they had Mike McQuarrie at that time. So here's what happens. At that moment, Jerry and his supporters start to try to have a counterattack. So they have, they have some of his biggest supporters, people who have gone to the Second Mile charity, write letters to the editor in his defense. One of them is, you guessed it, Alan Myers. Come on. Al- Alan Myers, in his own name, Come on. writes two letters to the editor outlining everything I just told you about the going to my, the, the Jerry's mother's funeral and standing in as his, as his father for his high school football game. And I believe he even mentions the commencement address, maybe even mentions the wedding, all these things. It's all in public record. It's accuser in the public record. one is a character witness for I, the accused. Technically he's victim number two. He's the oh, Mike okay. McQuarrie a, a, accuser kind of technically, but here's, this is, this story gets more amazing. So he writes these letters mm-hmm. in the, in the, in the paper. I have them. I put them publicly at framingpaterno.com. I can actually show it to you on my phone during a break. And so he he then gets interviewed by investigators in September of November of uh, September of 2011, which is two months before November when the story becomes nationally known and the shit hits the fan and Joe Paterno gets fired. And he ends that interview, according to his own words, he ends that interview with investigators saying, I think you're trying to get me to lie about Jerry Sandusky. I will never say anything bad about Jerry Sandusky. So that's how that interview ends. So that's in September. It gets even more amazing. So Jerry gets arrested November 9th, 2011. The shit hits the fan. Everyone's going bananas. On November 7th, it becomes publicly known that Mike McQueary was the witness in that infamous episode. It be, it's, it's reported everywhere, everywhere on that Monday. Clearly, Alan Myers finds out about this episode and goes, wait a minute. I'm the guy who was there. Right. That's not what happened at all. So on November 8th, he goes into Joe Amendola's office, the office of the uh, defense attorney for Jerry Sandusky. And this to me is an amazing little tidbit of, of, of factoids. Shows you how incompetent Jerry's defense team was and, and how overwhelmed they were. So Alan comes into the office with his mother ready to give a statement that blows apart the entire prosecution case. And Joe says, Come back tomorrow. I don't have anyone here to take your statement. So Alan goes home. (laughs) What? I know. Alan comes back the next day on November 9, 2011, again with his mother. This time there is an investigator, a a former police officer, FBI trained investigator, who takes Alan's statement. You can find it at framingpaterno.com. I have the whole statement. It's extraordinary. It's incredibly detailed. It has things in there only the McQuarrie kid could possibly know, including the door slam and the fact that uh, Jerry had told Alan that Penn State might call him, but never did a couple of weeks after this ep- episode occurs. And he says, I don't know what the hell Mike McQuarrie is talking about. I'm that kid. And there was nothing that happened. And Wait, so, so let's just yeah. be clear. <laughs> the kid in the Mike McQuarrie episode who Mike McQuarrie said saw in a mirror Yes. Steamy or whatever, right? In some inappropriate situation, exactly. right. is standing up and saying, "Listen, I am a Marine sergeant, exactly, yes. and I am telling you with the definitiveness of a grown ass man who has known this person, right. Jerry Sandusky, for decades. Right. I love this guy. I was right. there. It was me. Nothing inappropriate happened. Bingo. But here's what happens that night. This is November 9th. That's an incredibly important day." So the, he's literally within miles of where Joe Paterno later that night is fired, along with the president of Penn State University, Graham Spanier. 
Once Paterno and Spanner get fired, the world has changed. There's a massive earthquake. And the next morning, there's a headline in Business Insider, Penn State on the hook for $100 million for Sandusky accusers. There's, there were riots that night at, at state, on state colleges camp, on the Penn State campus. The, everything about the world has changed. And here's the short story of what happens with Alan Myers. So, Joe Amendola thinks, we got this thing nailed. We got the kid. We, we, we McQuarrie's done. It's over. Stupidly, in retrospect, Joe Amendola does not call a press conference immediately, which is what he should have done. No kidding. Immediately, you call a press conference and you say, Listen, Look, world. Yeah, here's but here's the kid. But Joe's thinking like a defense attorney. He's thinking, all right, I want to hold this for strategic purposes. Uh, we're gonna, you know, pounce this on them at a preliminary hearing or whatever, and and you know that's when that's the right way to do this. He's not thinking about this from a PR standpoint, which he should have been. And in fact, it, he, I believe he actually makes a critical error, being overconfident. With the regard to the Bob Costas interview, I'm sure many of your listeners are remembering, well, wait a minute, what about that horrible Bob Costas interview where Jerry sounds guilty as hell? Right. Well, what happens there is this. Amadola still thinks he has Alan Myers. He tells Bob Costas, and I've spoken to Bob Costas a couple different times about this. He tells Bob Costas, look, we've got the kid. And I guarantee, because I've been in situations like this, Costas is... Eyes are probably lighting up like, holy crap, really? Yeah. And Joe is thinking, all right, I've, Joe, Bob gets it. Bob gets it. Maybe this is worth a shot. So without any preparation at all, he says to Bob, because he wants to show Bob, I'm not afraid. I got nothing to be afraid of. You want to talk to Jerry? Well, Bob being a journalist goes, shit, yes. yeah, I'll talk to Jerry. Right. So Joe calls up Jerry and says, Hey, I'm going to put you on the phone with Bob Costas. Okay. Mm-hmm. Jerry being, Jerry, who, you know, if his lawyer tells him to do something, he's going to do it. So, sure, okay, fine. Amendola thought it was going to be for two or three minutes. Mm. Costas is a smart guy knowing, I get Jerry Sandusky on the phone. I'm not leaving. I'm not stopping until he hangs up. Yes. Right. Right? right? So Costas, whether you want to call it a misunderstanding or whatever, there was a misperception of what that interview was going to be. Sandusky was completely unprepared. And Joe Amendola was overconfident because they think they have Alan Myers. So J- Jerry gets asked the infamous question, are you sexually attracted to young boys? Now, to the outside world, I can totally understand why people go, why is he hesitating when he, when he answers, am I sexually attracted to young boys? Well, I, I like spending time with young boys. I, I enjoy their company, but, but no, no, I, I, I'm not sexually attracted to young boys. That's almost exactly what he says. And I, when I watched it, I'm like, oh my God, that was terrible. But I have to tell you, that was the first moment I thought, is it possible this guy's innocent? Because I didn't, I didn't come to the conclusion, but I thought, that's really odd because what we're being told to believe here is this guy was a pedophile for 40 years in high profile positions and couldn't answer the question, are you sexually attracted to the young boys? I mean, if you're you a would think that would be a rehearsed answer. Right. If you, if you're a pedophile, if you're a real pedophile, you have that one nailed and you respond, no, no, not at all. As a matter of fact, oh, no, oh, no. I mean, there's no question what the answer is. But in, then, in, 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 but here's the the other part of this equation. So I interviewed Jerry Sandusky twice in prison for a total of about six hours, uh, most of it on tape. And it, what's very clear, you can hear it for yourself. This is the way Jerry Sandusky talks. You can ask him anything, and if he mm. has, and if he hasn't thought it through, he's going to go, hmm, um. Do I like the color green? Um, yeah, that one color green is pretty good. Uh, yeah, I do like the color green. That's the way he talks. It drives his wife crazy. <laughs> so, um, I, un- I understand why people think that that was the smoking gun moment. Sure. But when in fact it was actually totally understandable when you understand the full context, but no one's going to take the time to, to understand the full context. I get that. But then, but here's what happens with Alan Myers. So the Al- Alan Myers causes a overconfidence, I believe, in Joe Amendola, which causes the Bob Costas interview. But then Amendola gets some bad news. Mm-hmm. He gets told by a local state college attorney named Andrew Shubin, who's a key figure in all this, hey, Joe, I just want you to know I'm representing oh, boy. Alan Myers. And Joe at first thinks, 
Okay, fine. Alan needs representation. This is going to be a shitstorm. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, that's fine. And Andrew Shubin, according to Joe, says, no, Joe, you, you don't understand. Alan Myers is a victim in this case. And Joe's like, what the fuck? Yeah. What the f- There's no way. There is just no way. And so what just happened? Exactly. Yeah. What just happened, which is here's what happened. As fate would have it, Alan Myers had gotten two DUIs in the previous year. His attorney in both of those DUIs was Andrew Shubin. Oh boy. And his mother had once worked for Andrew Shubin as a secretary in his office. What clearly happened was Andrew Shubin connected this Alan Myers who he had represented recently to Jerry Sandusky, and I guarantee Shubin went to Alan and said, anything ever happened with you? Because Shubin is, at, at this point, this is important, Shubin is advertising on his website for Sandusky accusers. That's not an exaggeration. He's advert. he is full, he's out in the press, he is full out there advertising. Please jump John, let this. me help our audience here, because we understand where you're, com- where you're coming from here and where you're going. But I think just for clarity for our audience, everybody needs to understand that there is free money. Oh. Penn State can't wait for this thing to go away, and they will show up at your house with a wheelbarrow full yes. of money just to make this goddamn thing go away. Yes. Bingo. And it's worse than that. It's well, worse than that. Let me add, can we add to the thing you're saying also? And you have a guy that has two DUIs. Right. And he's going to go to jail. He's going to go to jail. Unless he could use some cash. Yeah. Well, well cash he's, got no, he's no longer in the Marines. Right. He has no job. He's married. This guy needs a break. He needs yeah. he needs money. Mm-hmm. And to your point, it's not just the fact that Penn State wants us to go away. It's worse than that. Because the same people that are making the money decisions, the Penn State Board of Trustees, yeah. are the people that just fired Joe Paterno. Sure. And they need a reason for yes. why they did it. Otherwise, they are, they, wow. otherwise they are damned for all time. Yes. Yes. So right. they desperately need pen. That's They fired the great Joe Paterno. Exactly. Everything about the, the incentives in this case are all flipped They're upside down. They're all backwards down. and upside like down. World War I. This <laughs> is. It's all, I mean, it's not a conspiracy. No. It's just a big pile of. Shit. Yeah. What's well, yeah. this events is that because there was child abuse, we're going to have to pay. You yes. know, we have to pay because if not, we fired Joe Paterno, yes. the god Joe Paterno, for the wrong reason. Yes. So there must be child abuse. And we have the- exactly. It's everyone has an incentive yes. to plead guilty to things that didn't happen, except for Jerry, who is so naive. Jerry thinks that God is going to save him here. Yeah. I mean, Jerry and Dottie are very religious people to the point where it has hindered my ability to help them. Right. Uh, their friends have told them it's kind of it's an inside joke among their friends cuz cuz Dottie always says, you know, we don't need to do anything cuz God will will save us here and their friends always say, well maybe God sent you John Ziegler and you're not helping. Yeah. Um and I always laugh, well God wouldn't send an asshole like me. That's uh, true, you know, true. you know, so he probably would have found somebody better than than me to do this. That was part one of our episode with John Ziegler. In part two, we discuss the timeline in greater detail and drop a couple more bombshells. We hope you're enjoying this compelling content. Come back for part two in a couple of days or subscribe to us in iTunes or Stitcher. And you'll get the episode automatically in your podcast app. Thanks for listening.